questions, tried to provide some additional information um, in this presentation. Um, so I hope you enjoy that as well. So to begin, why are we here? We are here because last September, City Council requested that um, the City, in collaboration with Waterfront Toronto and TRCA, um, undertake to look at a, a roadmap for accelerating uh, development in the portlands, that's both uh, flood protection and, and development, um, to look at doing that through uh, leveraging the existing work that was done, um, and we'll talk a bit about uh, what that was momentarily, um, and to look at the flood protection um, solution that was developed as part of the environmental assessment um, to assess whether there are any other alternatives to that and to report back to council on those alternatives. So we talk about building on the existing um, framework. The existing framework for the um, central waterfront is in fact the central waterfront plan. Um, there are a number of key elements of that plan you can see here, removing barriers and making uh, connections building a network of spectacular waterfront parks and public spaces, promoting a clean and green environment and creating dynamic and diverse communities. This is taken right out of the Central Waterfront Plan. It, uh, and, and in fact, it is what's guiding us and what we're doing um, in all facets of this uh, endeavor. For the Portlands themselves, um, when we uh, you know, apply those principles, um, we're looking at a mixed use um, development opportunity for the Portlands. Um, residential, commercial, retail, and industrial over the over the life of the of, of Portlands, and it's a very long life. Um, we're looking at the Portlands as a center for creativity and innovation, um, for knowledge-based industries, film and new media, and as we know, you know film and new media through the um, Film Studios precinct is, has developed and is developing and continuing to grow in the Portlands and doing very well. Um, and it's a new urban district uh, with new uh, neighborhoods, that will contain some of the best elements of existing Toronto neighborhoods, the things that make Toronto, Toronto. Key findings today. We have determined that the flood protection alternative um, from the EA, what was known as alternative 4WS, is fundamentally sound. We have also um, determined that through some modifications, minor modifications to the alignment of that alternative, we can reduce costs. Uh, and we can, in fact, uh, improve the opportunities for phasing the work. The modified plan um, includes generous public spaces and preserves the water's edge for the public. We heard that very clearly at the uh, previous uh, public meeting, um, that the public want access to the water's edge and that uh, the green spaces and open spaces in the public realm are uh, very important for these neighborhoods. We have confirmed that phasing um, will enable us to develop um, earlier will enable us to develop and release areas uh, in the portlands from the floodplain um, in, in pieces. Uh, we do not have to construct the entire floodplain, which we don't believe we do, um, the entire uh, river and flood protection in order to uh, develop in the flood uh, in the floodplain in the portlands. Um, the initial investment is reduced through phasing, so we can actually do parts of the uh, flood protection work at, at a lesser cost and allow work to begin, um, and development to begin in certain areas, which we'll talk about, um, releasing and generating revenues that will allow us to reinvest and do additional flood protection and do additional infrastructure work. Um, and in fact, we heard very clearly from the market, uh, from developers and investors, that the Portlands is simply too big to develop in one phase. It will develop over, over many, many cycles, real estate cycles and business cycles. Um, and it needs to be needs to be phased. It needs to be done in a in a uh, rational, logical um, way. And then finally, we've also confirmed that there is existing infrastructure in the Portlands that can support some development. Um, meaning, you know, we can we can create uh, buildings, we can create parks. Um, all of the infrastructure doesn't need to be constructed at once. It can be constructed in uh, in a sequence in a uh, really a cost beneficial way. Additionally. We've confirmed that phasing and cost sharing of infrastructure, and cost sharing of infrastructure is essential for development to happen. Um, it is still an expensive proposition, um, and the means to fund that um, proposition um, still have to be developed, uh, but they will include both public and private sector uh, resources. Uh, an upfront investment of somewhere between 150 and 300 million, depending on um, what the initial development is and where the initial development is, is, is actually required um, to allow for the higher order uses that we're describing, um, 
However, you know, additional work in the film studios, expansion of the film studios, could actually happen now. It would be able to happen uh, in advance of this work occurring. Um, phase development can be uh, undertaken while accommodating the existing uses in the port. And the port is an exist or is a, is a working port. There are a, a lot of existing port users, um, including the uh, Portland's Energy Center, Ashbridge's Bay, the Concrete Campus, Lafarge Cement, um, there's Salt Storage, there's the Toronto Port Authority, Portlands. All of those are very healthy and absolutely critical um, uses for the city. They keep the city operating and they need to uh, continue to operate in Portlands and in fact we can accommodate their continued operation um, while proceeding with development over a long term. Um, we mentioned revenues and funding sources have yet to be fully determined. Um, we'll be coming back to you with more information on that, uh, but it is complex. And then finally, this is just uh, one of many steps, and it's not the first step, one of many steps that uh, um, we need to take in order to realize the potential of the core lands. So I want to talk first about the flood protection. Um, we have determined that we can keep the river alternative 4WS that have, um, was identified in the EA. Um, however, through refinement, we can reduce the cost of that, we can make it more doable, we can um, allow it to happen in phases, allow development to also happen in phases. So to start, I want to talk a little bit about the three alternatives we looked at, um, these inner harbor, as did um, alternative number uh, 4W although Alternative 4W also had, um, as part of its uh, makeup, a spillway um, south to the ship channel, which you can see. Uh, no, you can't, so I won't even try that anymore. Uh, but it's the middle one. The, um, those two options are slightly different than what was in the EA, in that they have been uh, moved south. The river has been moved south of um, the, the Keating Channel and Lakeshore Boulevard. In the original environmental assessment, um, for both 2 and 4W, that um, floodplain and river channel were located north of Lakeshore Boulevard on a piece of property known as 40 Lakeshore. Um, and uh, there were issues surrounding that with respect to uh, interferences with the Gardner Expressway and its structure, uh, a number of other things that, uh, and issues that caused those um, alternatives not to be selected in the original EA. We looked at them as alternatives and, and selected them and moved them south um, for a number of reasons. One is that the, the properties they were being um, they were going through originally, as mentioned, were you know, impacted by the gardener. They are also impacted environmentally. And finally, council, in asking us to go ahead and do this um, study, clearly said we do not want to impact on the work that's now happening in North Keating. Um, that is work that is um, on a site called. Uh, the Home Depot site uh, by a development firm. They're looking at and they're proceeding based on work that was done previously, and we don't want to impact that. And therefore, these alternatives uh, were developed in this way. Uh, alternative 4WS, um, effectively, we looked at that from the standpoint of um, how can we um, really make more efficient floodplain? Um, how can we reduce cost? How can we um, improve? Um, development opportunities, yet still maintain those um, core objectives of the terms of reference and those core uh, things that the 4WS originally provided. So you can see here we've done some analysis on this from a cost perspective. Option two, uh, realign, is approximately $293 million. Now these are uh, estimates based on very rough orders of magnitude and not based on detailed design. Uh, option 4W is slightly more expensive than that, $300 uh, million, and 4WS realigned at about 355 Now, we should note that those numbers exclude for both 2 and 4W the cost of expropriating privately owned lands, and both of those uh, alternatives actually do route through private, uh, privately held lands as well as public sector lands. Um, with respect to uh, 4WS, it's predominantly through the public sector lands, the City of Toronto land specifically. There's a portion of it that um, is rooted through uh, lands that are owned by Lafarge. However, uh, we have agreed, in fact, during the EA process um, and as part of an amendment to the official EA, not to impact on Lafarge's 
operation for as long as they want to operate. They've been operating since 1927, um, and this work won't put them out of business. They will continue to operate their plant for as long as they see fit. Um, should note here that, uh, as well, the total areas you'll see are slightly different for each of the options. With respect to Fort WS realigned, it's a slightly larger land area because of some lake filling, and I wish this were um, around BS Rock Key, which I can't show you. Uh, I'll show you in bigger detail shortly. Um, in terms of park space, effectively, park space can be and will be designed um, as we move forward through the EA process and precinct planning and planning processes. Um, so we've uh, said the park space should be equivalent in each one of these op options. Um, from the standpoint of green space, however, the floodplain in 4WS is substantially larger uh, than in either 4W or 2, meaning that the green space overall and the open space, public open space, is about three and a half hectares larger than um, the nearest, closest uh, alternative. Additionally, uh, 4WS provides the largest development area of the three options. So in looking at um, all of those um, factors, we have come to the conclusion that 4WS is, in fact, um, the option that should be recommended to Council, um, and the option that, uh, sorry, 4WS realigned, the option should be recommended to Council, and should proceed through um, the following EA process um, for acceptance by the Ministry of Environment. Um, I'll just sort of repeat myself here. From, from the three um, core terms of reference criteria, city building, uh, 4WS provides more phases, allows for greater opportunities to accelerate uh, both flood protection and development in the portlands. It provides for the lowest first cost because of the phasing in order to uh, actually commence the flood protection and development um, with respect to 2 and 4W. Um, 2 specifically, you would have to construct the entire floodplain in the first phase. It can't be phased. With respect to 4W, it can be phased but in a um, slightly different way. And um, 4WS provides the largest area of developable land, as mentioned, as well as the largest area of, of parks and open space of the three alternatives. Um, providing the largest uh, floodplain also provides for the most habitat, most natural habitat um, from a naturalization perspective. And in fact, um, it provides greater flexibility for conveying the flood uh, due to the three outlets, um, the outlet through the portlands to the inner harbor and the two spillways along um, Ship, to the ship channel and through Keating Channel. So we want to compare those two. 4WS preferred from the EA and 4WS realigned. You can see that um, there is some phasing ability for 4WS preferred from the EA, although in the EA it was not identified that there was uh, phasing potential. We believe that it can be. Um, 4WS preferred is slightly larger than the realigned version. Um, that's due to the promontories that exist on the ends of the Cousins and Colson's Keys. Um, the uh, reduction in those promontories, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily, um, is about four hectares, and that results in about an overall four hectare loss of parkland. It translates into parkland because Lakefield cannot be used for development, it can only be used for green space and open space. Um, additionally, the floodplain, because of the efficiencies in the realigned alternative, um, we can reduce the floodplain dimension by about four hectares, and that has generated about four hectares in additional development area. Um, when I say development area, those are neighborhoods, effectively. Those neighborhoods will include parks and open spaces and plazas, as well as buildings and roads and, and all the rest of that. Just uh, for a quick comparison on the keys themselves, the um, original uh, 4WS preferred provided about a total of 8.7 hectares on Cousins and Polson's Key combined. Um, the revised uh, 4WS realigned provides about 7.7 .7 hectares. So there's about a, a one hectare difference in the total amount of parkland proposed for those keys. It, it, is, uh, it is not a lot of space. But in fact, it is, it is a lot of space. Um, we've uh, gone out and, and taken a look at some of the local parks, um, trying to give you some feel for what in fact um, could, be, uh, could be done on the ends of the keys. Uh, we have Don River Park shown, and unfortunately for most of you who haven't seen that or experienced it, it's about 7.3 hectares and it includes fields, playgrounds, a marsh, uh, splash pads for uh, children. It's, uh, it's going to be a lovely space when we can open it up next year. 
Um, Dufferin Grove Park, the middle one, is about to. Now, these are just examples of what could go there. We're not proposing uh, at this point that any of those uses necessarily go on this site. That's a uh, subject for a, a later day and further design work. Um, but we thought it's important to give a sense of scale what we're actually looking at here. Um, finally, as you can see, Withrow Park, some, somewhat larger than um, what could go on Cousins Key. Uh, it includes, again, dog runs, playgrounds, sports fields, rinks, and baseball diamonds. Some additional examples higher up uh, the entirety of uh, uh, Cousins Key. Um, McCleary Park, which is a park, the, or probably one of the only parks down in the Portlands now other than the uh, sports field, um, provides for baseball diamonds. It's about half the size um, currently. And finally, Kew Gardens is somewhat larger, um, and again, pavilion, track, rink, playgrounds, uh, very many social, you know, uh, park uses contained in those parks. So this is just some examples of, of parks that um, in, in and around Toronto um, that uh, would be similar to um, what we're looking at for Cousins Key. So question then, why 4WS Realign? What are the benefits of that? Um, 4WS Realign really um, addresses two issues that were actually addressed in words in the environmental assessment. Um, these were amendments made to the environmental assessment after it was submitted to the MOE last year. Um, one of those was that the promontories um, as uh, conceived at the ends of the uh, Cousins of Polson's Pier would impact on ship navigation and berthing along the dock walls. And in fact, we had, uh, as part of the E process, committed to um, mitigating that. Um, and here you can see that the, uh, the promontories um, are no longer shown. Uh, going into the inner channel, uh, inner harbor, they do in fact, we do have this promontory as I mentioned, maybe I can show it now. Uh, I still can. Um, up on the upper left, uh, surrounding what is S Rock Key. Um, additionally, we had committed and have committed to Lafarge um, that uh, this um, will not impact on their uh, ongoing operations. I mentioned they've been operating since, uh, 19, since the 1920s, um, and uh, as long as they're prepared to continue operating a concrete plant on their lands, um, this process and, and project uh, would not impact on them. Um, and uh, so those are two key things, but those are commitments that were actually made prior to us starting this process. What you're seeing is the, the actual physical implementation of those commitments in this plan. Um, additionally, uh, 4WS Realign does provide uh, about four additional hectares of developable land area. It uh, allows for increased phasing opportunities um, and allows for the acceleration of, therefore, of the flood uh, protection work, as well as acceleration of development, and I'll talk about how that happens shortly. The um, uh, realignment has created improved development blocks, um, both north and south of the river, as well as on Cousins and Colson's Key. Uh, the previous alignment provided for uh, blocks that were very inefficient, difficult to design and develop um, in some cases. The uh, realignment also enhances river views and improves access to the public realm, uh, given that the river has been uh, realigned to abut to the Don uh, Roadway, as well as uh, north, potentially, to uh, Commissioner Street. We should note that um, as we go through the environmental assessment and planning processes, um, we are going to um, maintain a right-of-way, a potential right-of-way for the river to allow for minor modifications. You can see that on this drawing, um, a line slightly below the river, and if through the design process it's determined that the river should meander a little bit more, um, should move uh, up or down, or rather uh, south of commissioners, that can happen. Um, finally, um, this alternative has allowed us to reduce the cost, both the first cost and the overall cost of flood protection. Um, it's a, resulted in about um, savings in the order of $130 million dollars, those savings relate to the removal of the promontories, uh, the elimination of bridges and utilidors and, and efficiencies created by uh, the realignment in those bridges and utilidors. The, the length of those has been reduced. Um, we've simplified construction detailing. We've actually reduced the floodplain, which of course results in reduced costs. And um, by using, uh, utilizing the Lafarge slip for the mouth of the river, um, we've been able to save money because we don't need to now dig a new um, opening for the mouth, the new mouth, and backfill uh, the existing slip. 
Um, so recommendations um, as we go forward through the summer. We'll get more feedback from uh, stakeholders and from the public, but our, right now we're looking at draft recommendations that would endorse, uh, request City Council to endorse the uh, realigned uh, alternative for WS um, and uh, ask us to proceed with the environmental assessment on that basis. Um, we would uh, proceed to develop a phasing strategy and a regulatory framework for the acceptance of the um, uh, phased proposal. We would have to do that with the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Natural Resources, and the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, all of whom have uh, interests in this. And then finally, we will look to protect the proposed corridor for the uh, river um, through uh, uh, whatever um, necessary uh, legislation bylaws and uh, planning vehicles are required through OPA, secondary plans, conservation easements, whatever the most effective means of uh, protecting that corridor are. Additionally, um, from a planning perspective, a uh, land use planning perspective, again, um, as part of the land use work, um, protection of the corridor um, would be uh, undertaken. We would set, uh, set the framework to uh, begin the precinct planning process for those precincts that are uh, potentially uh, going to proceed. We would proceed to revise the Lower Don Lands Class EA Infrastructure Master Plan that was submitted and accepted by Council as part of the uh, previous process. Likewise, we would revise the Keating Channel Precinct Class EA Environmental Study. We look to identify and retain lands for, for potential transformational uses, and I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, and finally, um, very important to um, owners and users of lands in the port lands, as well as to the city itself, that we maintain existing uh, industrial uses and operations in the port lands that are uh, critical for city operations. All right. With respect to transformational initiatives, um, some of the examples we've looked at, these um, installations, cultural, business, um, were, uh, they changed the market when they were constructed. They created a market when they were constructed. They really triggered development uh, and allowed development to happen in a more fulsome way. We think it's important that um, the city protect for the potential of this happening um, at some point in the future. So secondarily, or, or next, we want to talk about the phasing and costs of flood protection. Um, we do this so that we can then move to the next phase, which is how do we fund um, and finance those costs over the life of the project. So I mentioned from a phasing perspective, um, in, in so doing, that allows us to remove the uh, Cousins and Polson's keys from the floodplain. Um, and it, it, they, are, they can be removed from the floodplain because they are kind of at the edge of the flood zone. Um, they would have to be raised somewhat um, and provided with some infrastructure, but this would be the um, first, earliest, and least expensive um, phasing of work. Um, however, having said that, um, you can see that over the life of the development, if, uh, if and when, not if and when, when all of this land is developed over time, the total uh, cost of the infrastructure and flood protection to service that land is in the order of you know, 500 or 450 million dollars. That money need not all be spent up front. Um, in order to start development, but uh, over time would be required. Flood protection landform, also north of Lakeshore Boulevard, on the east side of the Don Roadway, as well as raising the Don Roadway itself, would remove the uh, entire floodplain east of the Don Roadway. So I'm just going to flip back to this previous figure. You can see the floodplain identified in yellow here. Um, phase two of flood protection would remove all of South Riverdale, um, South of Eastern, uh, and the remainder of the port lands from the floodplain. We've identified here um, the infrastructure costs related to development in um, what is called what we're calling precinct death, which is the film studio lands. And again, we're doing this because we know that development, um, while while some development may happen in other areas, um, uh, development is going to be concentrated in certain uh, precincts, specific precincts, and this is one of them that we've looked at. Um, the cost of the flood protection in this, uh, in this scheme is about uh, $115 million to do what was uh, uh, the work that I just mentioned. And again, the additional infrastructure required is in the order of about uh, half a billion dollars. Again, that's over the life of 
the project, you'll um, actually, when you flip a couple of sheets ahead, and I'm not going to dwell on that when I get there, you'll see all of the infrastructure components that comprise these costs. Phase three, uh, from the port lands in uh, what are we, what we're calling precincts E2 and 4, which is the uh, lower dawn lands north and south of Commissioner's Road. Uh, cost to do that, about 262 million in flood protection costs, and then uh, some fairly major infrastructure costs. And then finally, phases four and five um, reflect the creation of the mouth of the river um, at the uh, inner harbor. Um, phase four is the north side of the Lafarge Slip, um, which can be done um, and may need to be done in advance of phase five, which is the south side of the Lafarge Strip, um, which uh, work will uh, not be done until uh, Lafarge has uh, concluded their operations on their lands. So in terms of the overall, uh, um, over time, uh, obviously the, the time value of money uh, creates additional costs, but additional costs are also generated due to um, uh, mobilization and demobilization over uh, a number of phases of work. Um, the work is um, done, it can't be done quite as efficiently and there's actually some interim work that has to be done. Uh, nonetheless, this does actually allow work to happen faster than it otherwise would. Um, but as you can see, overall, in the uh, full term of the Portland's development, there is approximately $1.9 billion worth of infrastructure um, required. That is going to take many, many years to construct and is in fact not going to be required for many, many years. Um, here's the uh, chart that I was mentioning, the columns. Um, below that is the infrastructure work that needs to be done, major infrastructure work, so major roads, major bridges, parks, and the like. So funding. We started to look at funding. Uh, we started to look at financing. We just haven't finished looking at those uh, components. Um, you know, we know that um, there are certain funding sources available. We started to examine those land sale revenues, area-specific development charges potentially, um, uh, landowner cost-sharing agreements, front-ending agreements, um, straight private sector investment. Uh, we've looked at tax increment financing and just government debt financing. Um, the total amount of financing and funding is not yet required because we don't know what the initial phase of work might actually cost at this point in time. We're, we're trying to work that out. Um, and we know also that not all of these sources of funding are, are likely or feasible um, for a number of reasons. For example, TIF financing is, is not feasible because the city requires the future tax revenues on which a TIF would be based to fund the ongoing operating costs of the new neighborhoods that would be constructed by those taxes. Um, they need to continue to provide municipal services, fire, police, um, snow removal, parks maintenance, and all of that, and really would have no sources of revenue to do that if, if their future revenues uh, and future taxes were, were borrowed effectively in order to construct the, uh, all the materials and, and, and installations that they need to maintain. Um, we also looked at debt financing from the city's perspective, and, and while um, the private sector could, in fact, um, finance based on future development charges and future taxes, um, they would require a guarantee from the government um, for those uh, revenues, those cash flows. Um, if there was no guarantee, uh, the private sector investment in, uh, and lending um, organizations simply consider the risk to be too great because there is not a, a steady stream and a guaranteed stream of income to uh, pay for the uh, loans and bonds that they would issue. So we don't believe that um, straight government debt financing is uh, is a solution either, uh, particularly particularly in these times uh, when governments are um, you know uh, looking at uh, reducing costs to uh, make their uh, make ends meet. Next steps. So for our next steps, the first uh, item we've got here, we need to start some uh, preliminary design um, in terms of uh, naturalization green space and, uh, and the alignment of the uh, flood protection. We need to finalize the business and implementation plan. Uh, so we need to finalize the business plan and we'll be doing that over the next uh, two months, uh, two to three months. We need to undertake a peer review of the business and implementation plan. So um, that will actually start uh, probably in the next two or three weeks as we uh, retain a, 
a peer reviewer uh, to start looking over the work that we've done to date. We need to identify and review additional potential sources of funding, consult with property owners on the formation of landowner groups, um, front ending and other appropriate cautionary agreements, and, and begin to understand what appetite and ability the private sector has for funding yeah. some of this work. We need to um, then conduct the next round of public consultations when we've uh, um, got the next uh, round of information, bring it to the public and get feedback on that. Um, and finally, uh, we need to continue to review the provision of transit to the Portlands, uh, part of the long-term uh, rapid transit funding strategy. And that's all. Good. A couple minutes long, but a lot of